Howdy. It's Alex. Welcome back to Prosperous. So we've had a question for a while uh, coming over and over if Bitcoin has failed as a hedge against inflation. And I think it's a fair question, particularly if you look at what the performance of Bitcoin has been recently. Certainly since inflation has come in, uh, the performance of Bitcoin has been quite horrendous. So what I th thought I'd do is just try to essentially answer two quick questions. First is to discuss Bitcoin in the context of inflation, as well as other instruments that you can do to combat inflation. And then look at this concept of hyper-Bitcoinization and money supply. So the first thing is we've talked about in kind of great detail how Bitcoin is a new technology, that its only value is in its adoption as a network. And so very much like any other fiat asset or any other asset in which the value of the asset is not connected to some operational utility. So again, kind of a currency, just like any, you know, pretty much anything else or commodity, think gold, and we'll talk about gold in a second. The idea is that the more people believe that it has value, the more it has value. And of course, this can be used, you know, to create all kinds of instruments that, you know, nonsensical. Uh, and we could have a whole discussion about social NFTs and other things like this. But the idea here is to try to understand the idea that Bitcoin has two equilibrium positions, one in which it gets rejected for whatever reason uh, by the community as being a store of value or having any value. And I think a lot of people believe that, that it has no value. It doesn't make any sense. It is you know, not tied to anything compared, for example, to the US dollar, which is backed by military and metaphors that people use. And another equivalent position in which you have a set, however big, of believers, or believers is, is, is probably the wrong word, but people who have adopted it, network participants, who see in the logic of how it was constructed in its decentralized nature, in its extremely you know, simple nature, and I'd admit that I'm one of them to some extent, believe that there is another equilibrium position in which people who want to have permissionless, trustless, permanent record of ownership of a scarce asset can subsist in a community in which Bitcoin has value to each other. We've talked about before, you know, you may not like an Andy Warhol painting, but it has value to whomever believes it has value, right? And in that case, it could represent an asset which has value and can get transacted and has a sense and meaning and value and utility to 1% of the planet, 10% of the planet, or 100% of the planet. And again, there'll be an equilibrium position over time. Uh, and of course, zero, which is where some flaw comes in. So I'm perfectly willing to accept and, 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 and believe that there could be, even after 13 years, 15 years now, a flaw in the design. There could be a reveal as to the identity of the original creator that could put the whole thing in disrepute. There could be a number of different things that could happen, like a particular actor taking uh, a significant portion of the available Bitcoin out there and therefore polluting, if you want, the belief in the decentralized nature, not of the protocol itself, but of who holds it, right? So imagine if, for example, Saudi Arabia owned 20% of all the Bitcoin out there, then perhaps it would be viewed as something which is not as decentralized and not as good of, of a universal store of wealth, perhaps simply because one actor has you know, so much of it. The thing which I think is interesting on this graph, and again, this is easier on YouTube than, than on the podcast, and we'll put a link to the video in case anybody wants to watch it, is to look at the growth in network addresses, which is on the screen right now, right? And so to describe it, basically, and, and again, this is Glassnode, and it's relatively trustworthy as a source of information, but again, you have a log scale for the price, which I think is fair, but you don't have a log scale for the adoption, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But still, having said all that, what you can see is that the 
network adoption has not fallen down to a level of irrelevance, right? The, if you look at the number of addresses, if you look at activity, this is one metric, but there are many others that you can look at. And if you look at the activity, amount transacted, number of nodes, people accumulating it, and there's all kinds of different groups of people out there, what you see is you see somewhat of a vibrant network, or at least one which has not collapsed, right? If you were to look at MySpace, if you were to look at other networks out there that have been uh, used and that have fallen in low usage, you would see materially lower numbers in terms of activity and active addresses and so on and so forth than what you see here. What you see in this part of graph on the right, and again, I'll describe it, is that you know we're pretty much at the levels of, that we were at in 2020 to 2021, and we're above the peak of where we were at the peak of the last cycle, right? You know, reasonably consistently, even now after this quote-unquote crypto winter. So, you know, you've seen network activity go down by, you know, somewhat of a substantial amount, but it's still only relatively 10 to 15 percent of the total activity. This is nowhere near to, say, a 50 percent or 80 percent, something that you would see when somebody is abandoning a network. This is not a network that's being abandoned, right? So what's interesting about that is that it doesn't give you the vibes of something which has arguably fallen in complete disuse, and even in the narrative out there and so on and so forth. Understandably, Peter Schiff's of the world and the rest of the people who have never believed in it will continue to never believe in it. But those who do, which again, back to the Andy Warhol metaphor, only needs to be a sufficiently large, albeit still very small minority of people, still believe in it and still kind of use it. To put that into perspective, you can see that inflation had been within a range. And over the last 30 years, the average inflation, including owner's rents, which basically means also including real estate, which has had you know, quite a run, and the expense of real estate, which is a very large part of wallet, has been around 5% for going on 30 years, uh, 35 years, right? Up and down, target rate from the Federal Reserve was 2%. Uh, X housing, uh, but you know, we have lived with inflation for quite a long time. Certainly as a result of COVID and transfer payments and so forth, it's exploded and we are where we are today in this situation. And so looking at the situation for the last year, let's say since inflation has become more of a topic, then certainly you can look at Bitcoin and tell yourself that that has not helped you in any possible way. And I think that's a fair point, but I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is going forward, what are the assets that you can comfortably put yourself into in terms of transferring generational wealth through time, right? So if you had a certain amount of assets and you wanted to go out and, and get them to move around time from now into the future, where would you go, right? And we're not going to go through bonds, but I think, you know, certainly the last you know, 15 years, quantitative easing, after the great financial crisis, the general path of interest rates have shown that bonds have basically come to a point where there are very, very low rates in terms of your ability to get a return out of them, well below inflation, while bonds themselves over the last 15 years have done very well, again, because they went from a high interest rate environment or a relatively high interest rate environment to a lower one, right? So wealth is accumulated into a bond portfolio. But again, the question is what to do going forward. We are in a bizarre inflation moment, and there's a lot of questions as to whether it's going to get fixed or not. But I think it's worth looking at whether it gets fixed or who doesn't get fixed, what the impact is likely to be of either staying at high inflation levels or coming back down to a normalized level. Either way, what matters for bonds, for example, is the relative level of interest rate, which is still fairly low, which means that it either stays where it is or it goes up, which again is not particularly good for the safest part of what has been uh, the portfolio for you know, 10 to 15 to 20 years. The idea that bonds was uh, you know, where you kind of took the least amount of risk is, is definitely a narrative as everybody, I think, now has come to the conclusion is something which is a little bit tenuous. What's interesting to look at is if you look at M2, the money supply, and also the impact of the Federal Reserve, and this is in the US, putting money into the system. If you were to look at this in Europe, it looked more or less the same. But certainly, you know, kind of a steady increase over time, and then quite a substantial one. If you were to look at it on a percentage basis, you know, you would kind of see the same thing that what we said before in inflation, which is that you kind of see a 5% growth steady up until 
2008 and up until COVID, right, a steady state, 5% increase in money supply, steady, at the same time that you have a 5% in, you know, rise in inflation. So kind of balances out a little bit if you really look long term in that way. Again, since COVID, you've had quite a substantial amount of liquidity put into the system because of, you know, a number of different reasons that we've discussed before. If you look at it on, on a log basis, right, which I think is a little bit more representative, then you can see how steady it was until COVID. So if you look at 1990, let's say in this case 1998, but if you go back again further out, uh, you'll see pretty much the same. A little bit of acceleration still, uh, uh, certainly an acceleration after 2008, uh, which is around here, right? Then a very significant increase after COVID. So let's put COVID aside because I think that, that definitely has some impact. And the question is, you know, once you digest that, do you go back trend to, to form? But what's interesting is that if you pair it to the S&P index and if you look at just the behavior of equities against the money supply, what you see is that, you know, money supply in this particular case, and again, you can play with where the origins are. So if you go back back to the 1990s and the beginning of the 1990s, then the S&P certainly has exceeded money supply. But more interestingly, if you look, and starting in the 2000s, you do see that money supply vastly exceeded the return in the S&P. So what does that tell you? It, it kind of tells you that the S&P follows, and in this case actually kind of lags, the amount of money that's been put into the system throughout. I'm not saying that it supports valuation as much as it's, and, and, and again, remember the, the, this whole concept of, of, of having had a, an explosive growth in the valuation of equities. And again, equities is an interesting piece because you're looking at companies and because you're looking at an index, the most successful companies, because again, you weed out the bad companies out of the S&P on a routine basis, you're looking at their ability to stay up with inflation, with money supply, with, uh, forgetting for the moment you know, technology. We'll talk about that in, in a second. But basically what you see is that, well, you know, money supply has grown quite substantially, right? And this points to you again to this concept that a dollar is not really what a dollar was. So $10 of earnings, a $50 stock... Uh, hundred dollar bill, whatever it is, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's just a meaningfully different purchasing power instrument over time. And that there is this slow bleed in the last 20 years, of significant amount of money supply coming out. It's very important to understand money supply in the concept of productivity gains and the concept of living standards. And, and we'll get to that when we come to Bitcoin in a second. But still, you, you do see government, if you want, reflects the priorities of the population and through the election process process and so on and so forth. And we have had kind of a desire to cut taxes and a desire to have additional social services throughout the Western world that has created the only choice that governments has, have had to do in order to be able to accomplish both of these goals, which is running large deficits and financing them through quantitative easing. You know, worst example of that is Japan. But again, through you know, throughout the European and American systems, you see quite liberal monetary policy. Okay, all this is very interesting, but let's now go back and, and look at what your alternatives are. So let's look at, for example, the market cap of gold through time. And again, in this particular case, if you look at today's reserves, or you assume that those reserves kind of existed before, which is not true because reserves have increased, but just for fun, you look at graph of gold uh, over over time, and, and this is the market value of gold, right? And again, some estimate that about 85% of the market value of gold is a premium over its 15% industrial value, which means that if you only looked at gold for the purpose of using it in a industrial way, obviously the price of gold would be significantly lower. And in this case, the estimate is, you know, 85% of the value of gold is this kind of premium to the industrial value, which is an important point to make when you're comparing it to currencies and to uh, crypto generally. So there what you see is that starting in 2008, right, starting at the great financial crisis, you see a very significant increase in the price of gold, which means that it was being used more and more as a hedge asset against financial conditions, inflation, problems, whatever you want to call it, because it has capacity to be an asset that people understand, that people feel have a fixed supply and be a hedge against financial assets of, of all different types. Historically, it's been an asset that you go to in inflationary times and also in financial disruptive times because it has this hard money aspect. So again, you know, if you're looking at times in the 90s and before, then, you know, you're in the 
two to three trillion dollar in total market cap. And again, this is a hack number. It's relevant over time. Uh, it could be off, but this is relatively indicative of what's changed. Now, you see this massive run up between 2004, let's say, and 2012, right? During those times, before, during, and after the financial crisis, where you see gold being seen as a safe harbor for generational transfer of wealth through time. Let's get into gold. And you see this achieving all the way up to about $12 trillion uh, in uh, 2012, and then slumping through the economic development and, and, and success of the 2010s. And as you come back into COVID, as you get to 2020 and 2019, 2020, you see it rise back to the 12 to $14 trillion size. Now, what's fascinating about this is however bad things are, right? Gold in the last two years has been flat, right? Um, and what that tells you, if anything, and this is, you know, try, let's look at since the beginning of COVID, we're talking about something in which the, you know, total market cap of gold has been somewhat flat. And to be fair, you know, Bitcoin has lost quite a lot of value in the last year. But again, gold has not been the knee-jerk reaction asset that people go to in order to try to uh, hedge inflation. You know, a number of different reasons, and, and, and certainly if you were to look at the market cap of crypto and so on and so forth, there's probably a lot of money that's gone into that and other things since then. The point there is well, we don't have an answer yet as to whether uh, other instruments than gold and certainly, you know, real estate and some of the traditional hard assets that people go to in inflationary times and in, uh, you know, financial stress times are the ones that are going to succeed in the short term. There's a lot of discussion as to whether we're in an energy and commodity squeeze at this point. Uh, it, what's interesting is whether if you change your... Um, your point of view or your uh, horizon to instead of one or two or three years to five, 10, 20, 30 years, the question becomes where do you want to be invested in order to transfer this, this wealth over time, right? And um, gold is one that at least in the short term has not been discounted by users, by network participants, by investors, by people as the one to tap for the next leg, uh, uh, you know, for, you know for, for a number of reasons. In the face of massive monetary expansion, the money supply and printing of money has been so substantial in these two years, and you've seen, you know, kind of nothing coming out of gold. Now, think this concept of hyper-Bitcoinization and specifically kind of how does Bitcoin work with inflation and what's the main argument there? It's a fairly interesting argument because in 1971, we unpegged from gold, which basically meant that you could go out and print as much money as you wanted. Let's not forget that while it is true that a dollar is not worth what a dollar was then and so on and so forth, there's been enormous technology change, enormous social change, enormous... Uh, productivity changes in the last uh, 50 years that themselves are difficult to fit into this model. So th the argument is that um, a lot of the benefits out of this uh, uh, accommodating money supply over the last 40, 50 years since, say, 1971, let's say before COVID, let's, you know, COVID, I think, is, 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 is another topic. But the, the argument has been that <clears throat> a lot of the capacity to finance venture capital, new technologies, new markets, emerging markets, and other places on the planet has been facilitated by loose monetary policy because it allows, let's say, more risk in the system at a time of accelerating productivity. Uh, and therefore, risk capital and capital in the system is actually quite useful in some ways. It's a, not a, an entirely bad argument, but let's contrast this with this concept of super hard money, Austrian econ economics, and 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 specifically, you know, kind of 21 million Bitcoin hyper Bitcoinization. Th this is where it becomes a little bit more more difficult. More difficult, and I think the 
The argument is, for example, if you were to go back to 1971 and you were to not just not go off the gold standard, but actually lock into a certain standard, imagine Bitcoin existed at a time or that the money supply was forced to be fixed, what would have been the impact on the last 50 years of growth of having money which is absolutely absolutely fixed it's uh, it, it, you know to me it's unclear i think some some people would argue it would have made for balanced budgets it would have made for uh, you know perfect allocation of scarce resources but again scarce resources is not necessarily what what a system needs in in, in order to grow <clears throat> put another way bitcoin or fixed supply monetary supply tells you or allows you to look at a fixed pie that now you're competing with other actors, other companies, other producers, and you know, other uh, holders of wealth for, um, and compare that to, say, a steady 2 to 5% increase of the pie, or I should say the monetary pie, right? So you, you have this economic pie which is out there, which is driven by productivity, technology, change, living standard increases, all these things that are happening out there. The, you know, as, as Elon Musk, I guess, would say, the restructuring of atoms in a more valuable way for humans, right? Uh, and then you've got money, which is supposed to kind of keep track of it, and you've got a choice there, right? Do you keep that... Um, uh, 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 finance that, that uh, uh, total amount of monet, uh, you know, monetary pie, which is meant to reflect or value or somewhat be used to transact the true actual economic pie, right? Uh, is it better if it's fixed or is it better if it is in managed chaos, right? And for sure, what governments, what elections, what history, what the politics of the last 50 years has shown is that we prefer a chaotic inflationary system because there's been no no way to control it right to a fixed parity system where basically what we say is that there's a fixed amount of value monetary value out there against which productivity a growing economy a growing living standards more development technology change is now getting valued and so the only way that it works in a hyper uh, sense in let's say if you were to actually believe that now 100 percent of the network is going to be bitcoin not one percent not ten percent but a hundred percent that every single actor around is going to use Bitcoin for transactions at scale, not now, at scale, then the problem that you have is that you're forced to live with forced deflation, right? The price of everything has to go down in order to account for the fact, let's hope, that life continues, that living standards increase, that productivity increases, that technology brings new avenues, new beliefs, new, new, uh, new avenues of productivity and wealth, and now you still only have 21 million Bitcoin at scale to, uh, to represent it. And, and that's a difficult, that, that is really just a massive change. It means that, for example, salaries go down structurally, always, because your money is worth more every of a certain pie, which, you know, if the economic pie is growing, but the financial pie, which is measuring it, which is uh, allowing you to transact in it, is fixed, then you have structural deflation uh, with every passing year, right? It's an attractive concept, which is very difficult and would require you know, monumental change in people's views, right? People are used to, for example, uh, this 2% or 5% or X% percent increase every year. They're used to having a bonus. They're used to having a number of different things. Uh, and they live with this, you know, this chaos that we've lived through, inflation. is to make sure that you earn a little bit more than what your costs are going up every year, assuming that you know you have an average basket. Uh, uh, and, and, and the problem, of course, of the last two years is that that basket has completely changed and the expectations are now completely and, and totally all over the place, uh, both for everyone, you know, for obviously for consumers, but also for producers and people holding inventory and stock and all, all these kind of things. These decisions are now subject to massive uncertainty and uncertainty is not a good thing when it comes to economic uh, output. So I think we, you know, we need to digest. It. So the point here is, and I guess this is more opinion than anything else, I think 
you know, the concept of hyper Bitcoinization, having Bitcoin as the only asset, I think is one which is very, very far away, um, perhaps um, something to, you know, kind of maybe fight for, for those who, who believe in it. But I think for where we are right now, I don't think anything that's happened in the last year, two years, has invalidated the core premise that if you were to try to design a currency or an asset that some minority of the market wanted to use in order to measure each other's wealth, transfer each other's wealth, um, transact in a decentralized fashion and be entirely uh, transparent about it, it would be difficult to find an asset, uh, um, you know, kind of better uh, uh, structured with, than Bitcoin. It's not perfect. It, you know, has a lot of uncertainty as to a number of different things. But in terms of something that people can understand, people can, can use, and again, when it comes to, say, you know, five, ten, you know, percent of your portfolio, try to use as a hedge on how to understand how to maintain your piece of the overall economic pie through some instrument, right? Over time, I don't think anything has uh, has gotten really invalidated uh, uh, except for the price, right? And the price again is, you know. With all due respect and, and, and deserves respect to people like George Soros and reflexivity and other logic, yes, price does have an impact on price for sure. But, you know, in this case, price is a lagging indicator. Uh, uh, price will settle at utility, right? And again, if people through the Lightning Network, if people through remittances, if people through uh, uh, assignment of wealth and, and, and put portfolio positions uh, create a demand in this particular network. And again, the network addresses and the activity seems to under, uh, underscore this. this, this. Um, it, it remains one of the few new avenues of um, participating in a network um, for, at least for now, some sense of um, store of wealth, extremely volatile, complete, you know, the, the market and the liquidity of this market is, is still complete in, in its infancy, but the argument, you know, still has not changed, right? Uh, um, certainly people who bought it high have seen significant amount of wealth destroyed, and it may be years until it naturally, uh, you know, kind of gravitates back to a possible positive uh, economic positions but if you want when it comes back to the you know to, to the real use of it and what it was designed for and what the network does nothing's changed uh, only the price um, and so you know without being a fanboy and without thinking about it since we try to think of likely outcomes out there right uh, I, th you know, and and we'll end on this. If you believe that continued productivity will exist, that technology will continue to change markets, to create opportunities, to create uh, uh, increase in living standards, then um, the securities, the instruments, the assets that facilitate or otherwise get have more network adoption so for example think of it apple investing in apple is just a proxy for what is a network adoption of the apple ecosystem the ability of that it has to you know sell uh products and so on and so forth so again you know these these kind of adoption measures um nothing has really changed in that way uh uh, uh long term now that doesn't mean that this is, you know, that one should buy it or, or, or otherwise. But I think to answer the initial question, which is, has Bitcoin entirely failed as a method of managing inflation? I think it has, um, I, I think the last year is not data that provides any answer to, to this. I think that the only way to look at assets like this is an extremely long term. You have to look at them in decades. And 
like decades, you can't manage them as a hedge fund manager in order to get monthly returns. I mean, you can, but you, you, uh, at that level, it's an enormously risky uh, exercise. I think the only way to you know to try to fit Bitcoin into the financial logic um, is uh, to to you know, try to understand what is the likelihood of this equilibrium position coming into the future at some point. And and I think that the the situation has not changed. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening.